The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so uh, our goal for today is to basically analyze this simple model to death. All right, so we're first going to try to understand the um, deterministic behavior of this, of this model of gene expression, right, where we just get uh, transcription of mRNA and then translation of, of protein. And after we think we understand uh, the mean behavior, the deterministic dynamics, then we will try to understand uh, the stochastic behavior in this model. All right, so we're going to uh, try to understand you know, what's the distribution of uh, mRNA in, uh, in a cell in this simple situation, what's the distribution of protein, what's going to be the bursting behavior, right? everything, everything you can possibly think of to uh, ask about this model we will hopefully have asked by the end of uh, today's class. Right? This simple model of gene expression as was kind of indicated in the review is uh, perhaps a reasonable description of uh, gene expression in, uh, in bacteria when, uh, when the gene is kind of in some active uh, state, right? so there's no repressor for example bound. Okay. Uh, although maybe even in the presence of a repressor, and the, you know, if it's binding, unbinding, maybe you still end up getting some sort of renormalization that looks like this. Right? But, uh, but this is first order a reasonable description of uh, gene expression in bacteria. And it's, uh, it's the model that, uh, that was basically used in, in the Sunny Shee paper that we, uh, we talked about on Tuesday. And, uh, and hopefully this model will allow us to think uh, a little bit more deeply about uh, the data that they obtained in that paper. Okay. All right. Um, as always, we want to start by, by understanding the, the basic aspects of the model. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a kind of a series of questions uh, of increasing difficulty. And uh, in some of them, uh, we are indeed going to, the answers will end up being some, uh, something divided by something. All right, in which case, you take advantage of your cards and illustrate that by putting something on top, something below. Right? Okay. Um, and, uh, all right, but just first, in this model, you know, what is the unit of time? So if I say t is equal to 1 or delta t is equal to 1, what am I referring to? All right, so I'm, we're not going to use the cards, but uh, in particular, the question is, um, is delta t equal to 1, is that a cell cycle necessarily? Ready, uh, yes or no? Ready? 3, 2, 1. Well, I guess now I've maybe are, I've complicated things by... All right, well, this was really going to be relevant for the, the later ones. Uh, okay, I'm not even going to. All right, now I've, now I've totally confused you. All right, uh, but can somebody, can somebody offer why it may or may not be? Um, what, how do we think about the unit of time in this model? Uh, right, okay, so, and indeed, what we often do in these non dimensionalized models is we set something equal to 1. Right. Have we set anything equal to 1 here? No. Right. So in principle, we've said there's some degradation rate of the mRNA, some degradation rate of the protein. Right. And in general, those will be given in some units uh, you know, involving seconds or minutes or hours. Right. right. So in general, so at, at this stage, we have not yet, we have not actually uh, gotten to this uh, sort of non-dimensionalized version of any model. Right. So in this case, this is going to be Something like seconds or minutes or hours, okay, whatever, whatever units we, we use for, the, um, for those degradation rates. Right? So we, we, have not, uh, we have not done anything where it's the cell generation time or the protein lifetime, mRNA lifetime, or anything like that. You, everybody happy with this statement so far? Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and vote here. So we're going to do some A, B, C, Ds. And you can always combine any, anything you want. So we'll go ahead and, and say this is the synthesis rate of the mRNA. This is the degradation rate for the mRNA, the synthesis rate for the protein, the degradation rate for the protein. And uh, if, you are, um, con if you're just confused, you can just do this. But in, in, in general, for any of the questions we're going to do, you can do some combination of these guys by putting things in numerator and denominator. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Question is, if you uh, if you just look at these the cell population, and it's you find it's growing exponential. The question is, what is going to be that rate of exponential growth? 
have I done something wrong already? Okay, but we are, um, I am going to say that we're going to, now for this, we're going to assume that the, the protein is stable. So it's not actually degraded. Okay. This is to remind you of what we read about in chapter one, maybe, of Uri's book. Maybe chapter two. All right, I'll give you 10 seconds to think about this. All right, do you need more time? All right. Ready, three, two, one. OK, we got, um, hmm, we got a bunch of C's and a bunch of D's and some E's. All right, so the E's are going to argue with me, presumably, rather than their neighbor. Um, OK, I, I think that there are enough people that are disagreeing on this to maybe, yeah, go ahead. Turn, you should be able to find somebody that disagrees with you. The, it was, the distribution was a bit patchy, unfortunately. Did you guys, uh, how, all right, you guys are, you guys are worried that you're not going to be able to find somebody. Okay, so fine, fine. So yeah, okay. So if the uh, protein is stable, ah, so the mRNA may not be stable. The mRNA may not be stable? Ah, okay. Right. And in general, which, which one is, it typically has a longer lifetime? Proteins typically have a longer lifetime. Right. So mR mRNA uh, are often are, are actively degraded, typically. Right. And they're, they're also just kind of less stable in, intrinsically. But, uh, yeah. so, but what we're going to assume for now is that we're, we're working with, with stable proteins. Okay. In which case, the growth rate of the, of the population isn't just, uh, it will just be this uh, effective degradation rate of the protein. Right. So in this model, even if, even if we say there's no active degradation of the protein. Still, there's going to be some effective degradation that is due to, um, that's due to dilution. Okay? So we can say effective, if you like. All right, so the, the rate of uh, exponential growth of the population will be equal to this effective degradation rate for the protein if it's stable. Okay? So you're talking about the population of the protein? No. The growth rate of the cell population. So this is, this is if we go in there and you, you, you go into your spectrophotometer and you measure populate, you know, numbers of function time. It's growing exponentially. It'll grow exponentially with this rate. Because this is, this is what's causing the dilution. In some ways, you know, if, the, if, the, if you stop making the protein right, and you, you double the number of cells, then that means the concentration of the, of, the, of the protein in each cell has to go down by a factor of two. Right? So that's the statement. Are there any questions about? About why I'm making this argument. Yes. All right. So the relevance of the protein being stable, right? Because this is in general this. Um, okay. So this delta. This is this is the effective rate. This um, this is going to be equal to the the growth rate of the population. So you might call it gamma growth plus the um, actual degradation. Right. Uh, I don't I don't want to use the same. But I'll just say plus the degradation rate, and th this is this is the true physical degradation, true degradation rate of the protein, right? So if it's stable, then we say that then this thing is zero, right? So when we say stable protein, what it means is there's no degradation of the protein, right? So that this this physical degradation rate is zero, and then the effective degradation rate of the protein is just equal to the uh, the growth rate of the population. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other questions about what I mean by this? Okay. All right. So now what we want to do is ask a few other quantities about about this model. So for example, what will be the uh, number of mRNA per cell? And, and this is always going to be the mean. All right, I'm going to. All right, I'll give you 20 seconds. All right, in this model, what is the mean number of mRNA per cell?
All right. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. We have, I would say, a majority of the group is, going to, is saying it's A over B, which corresponds to the synthesis rate of the mRNA divided by the degradation. All right. Some people are this one. Um, yeah. So this is indeed yeah, synthesis rate divided by the degradation rate. All right. Now, this is, this is saying that what happens later doesn't really matter for the, MR, the mean mRNA number, right? Because it's just that it's going to be made at some rate. It's going to be, its lifetime is given by 1 over delta m. Now, this thing, of course, is again, always, as always, the effective degradation rate. So it's the sum of the, the sort of physical degradation rate plus the, the effect, this dilution due to growth. But in general, the true degradation the physical degradation is much faster than the cell division rate. So, um, so this, this is very close to actually just the, the physical degradation rate. Okay? Um, but in any case, it's just delta m, you know, regardless of. All right. Are there any questions about why, why this is the way it is? Yes? Does it matter whether it's only physical? Because like, wouldn't it yeah. be the same if it were? It doesn't matter that it's only, yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying, yeah. So the way that this is written, um, it doesn't matter whether the, uh, yeah, this is the answer regardless of, of whether the physical degradation rate is much larger than the growth rate or not, yeah. OK, happy with that. All right. What is the um, protein molecules per mRNA? How many protein molecules are made from each mRNA? I think protein produced Do you need more time? Right. Remember, this is the, just this is again the mean number of protein uh, proteins produced from a single mRNA or each mRNA. All right, let, let's go ahead and vote so I can see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. Right. All right. So I'm, I'm seeing, okay. So we have, I'd say, uh, you know, it's it's all right. So at least a majority are saying it's going to be C over B now. All right. So this is interesting. Right. So this is saying that you know that really what's happening is that there's a competition. Once you make an mRNA, that the proteins are going to be getting fired off at some rate. But eventually, it's going to be degraded. It's a competition between those two rates that determines basically how many proteins, you know, how many times do you fire off a protein before you get degraded. Okay. Any questions about that logic? Sure. All right. So what we're assuming is that okay, an mRNA is produced. Okay, that's already happened. So it doesn't matter what SM is anymore. Right, so now we have an mRNA, right? Okay. Eventually, this mRNA will be degraded. Right? But before that happens, you, we want to know basically how many proteins do we expect to be made. Right? Now, if sp and delta m are the same, that means that you kind of expect one protein to be made on average before it's degraded. Where if, it, if sp were twice delta m, then you would, get, you would get two proteins made before it was degraded. All right, now this is a mean statement. We're about to start thinking, you know, in, in 10 minutes we'll think about the, this distribution. And so we have, to be a little, we have to be careful. But in terms of the mean behavior, this, is, this, this thing is true. Is this different than calculating the number of proteins per mRNA in the cell? OK, is this different from the number of proteins in the cell? Number of proteins per mRNA in the cell. Um, <clears throat> 
OK, right. So this is not the same thing as asking about, about the, um, the ratio of the number of proteins to number. And we can calculate, we can calculate that yeah. as well. Yeah, these are different. This is, this, is, this, is, right, this is the number of protein molecules produced from each mRNA. All right, so this is just talking about production. Because indeed, the degradation rates are going to be different. So then, yeah, and we'll, we can see how, what that ends up being. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about, about what, why this one is what it is? All right. How about uh, the number of mRNA produced per cell cycle? And for now, we're going to ignore, um, we're going to ignore factors of log 2. Do you need more time? Okay. Just another 10 seconds. Produced but not degraded. Produced. Yeah, this is, I'm, we're just talking about production. Yeah, because we've already calculated the number of mRNA in the cell, right? But now we want to know the mean number produced. Uh, for example, this is the same as the mean number of, bur of protein bursts observed in the um, in Sunny Shee's paper, right? But yeah, this is just the number of mRNA produced per cell cycle. Okay. All right, let's see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we got lots of, uh, lots of A's over D's. So that sounds nice. All right, so there's going to be the some synthesis rate. But now the relevant thing is this uh, delta P, because that's, that's the cell, uh, cell division rate. So it's um, barring issues of log 2, it's approximately the synthesis rate of the mRNA divided by delta P, which, because this is, this is the, um, the growth rate of the population. All right, cell generation time is, is log 2 off of that. Okay. Are there any questions about, about that statement? From, uh, all right, so this is the mean number. Now, in, from the paper, we know how this thing is distributed, right? All right, we should probably, we're going to use a bunch of distributions over the next couple. All right, so uh, we can, all right, we, have, we like exponential distributions. We like, um, Geometric distributions. We like Poisson, we like Gaussian, and we like Gamma. All right. Quite, uh, these are various probability distributions. The question is, how is it that the now not the mean, but how is the number of mRNA produced per cell cycle distributed? Ready, three. Two, one. All right. We got some. Uh, this side of the room is a little bit slower, maybe, but that's uh, that's okay. All right. So maybe some people are not confident of this statement. Is that all right? So um, okay. So this one ends up being plus on. Okay. Right. So th this is indeed how the how the number of this is number mRNA uh, per cycle. Okay. Now, this is uh, so Poisson in general. That's what you get. There's some probability per unit time that something's going to happen, and you want to know how many of them happen in some finite time period. All right, it's basically the definition of a Poisson. All right. And this this is as if you recall, this is the what we talked about on Tuesday. The probability you observe n. It's given by this this mean number. Right, so it was this. All right, so if lambda is the mean, then we get lambda to the n over n factorial e to the minus lambda. 
And if you uh, go ahead and calculate the mean of this, you indeed get lam lambda. So um, lambda is equal to the mean, okay. which in this case was around. Well, in the case of, of Sonny's paper, does anybody remember what that uh, roughly was? It was around 1. Okay. Right. Now, what about, um, what about this other one? Right? So we also have another mRNA problem, which is the, we calculated the mean number of mRNA per cell. If you look at a cell, the mean number is this. Right? Well, what's the probability distribution? of the number of mRNA per cell. All right, so we probably, trying to think, of, uh, you probably don't yet know this answer. All right, this ends up also being Poisson. We're going to calculate this in, in a bit. But this is very confusing somehow, that both this thing and this thing are Poisson. But they're not the same Poisson in the sense they have different lambdas. Right? Which one has, is, is, is going to be larger, this one or this one? The bottom one, right? And that's because delta M is much larger than delta P, typically. Right? So indeed, if you ask in Sonny's paper, for example, there was you know, just over one mRNA produced per cell cycle. But the mean number of mRNA might have been you know, 1 30th of that, because the degradation rate was just one and a half minutes. Right? What that's saying is that, you t that in a typical situation, you would not see an mRNA in a cell right? in that condition. All right, we'll, we'll, we're going to calculate this in a moment, so don't worry if you don't see why it's a Poisson. But, um, but don't get confused that there are two different distributions that arise from the mRNA in the cell or in the cell cycle, and they're different Poissons. Uh, and, and I think that, I mean, I'm sure that in some deep sense there's a reason that they're the same, but it's, not, it's, you know, it's, it's somehow not immediately obvious, okay? All right, so there was another one that we might have wanted to do, which is the number of um, the mean number of proteins in each cell. Okay. Now uh, this one is a, is a bit harder, uh, and this one is going to take full advantage of the cards that you have in front of you. All right, so um, be prepared. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, because this one you might, well, you might need a little bit more time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, although I think that it, it's useful to see that it can be a bit tricky because this really is the simplest possible model. That we're going to be talking about some models that are get to be horribly complicated. Um, so it's useful to just make sure that you can nail down the intuition on, on this model. You know. All right, uh, do you need more time? It's OK if, if this is escaping you at this moment. Uh, all right, why don't we go and see where we are? Ready? Three, two, one. All right. All right, so you know, you know, all the naysayers on the cards, now that you've done this, you, you feel like it's an amazing system. Right, so it's AC over DB. So the, two, the product of the synthesis rates divided by the product of the degradation rates. Right. So what we have is, a, is the synthesis rate for the mRNA divided by the degradation rate for the mRNA, synthesis rate for the proteins divided by the degradation rate for the proteins. Okay. Can somebody uh, give us an, uh, a verbal explanation for why this might have been? Why this might, or why this is? Heather? Yes? It's, well, it's the, the same reasoning as the number of mRNA per cell, but instead of just a basal like a, a, a synthesis rate, it doesn't, doesn't depend on the concentration. 
you're just multiplying that synthesis rate by the number of mRNA. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so, so, what, you're, so what you're saying is that all right, this thing here was indeed, we calculated, all right, that's, that, that was the mean number of mRNA in the cell. Right? If you just start with something and you have a production degradation rate. Okay, well, that means that if you had one mRNA, then indeed that's what the concentration of protein would be, is this SP divided by delta P, right? But now we can say, all right, well, we just multiply by the, that by the number of mRNA, and then we are set. Okay? All right. Now, another question. What is the, all right, we, we have a distribution, or a mean uh, protein, wait, sorry, mean, where, mean number of, oh, yeah. We have the mean number of protein produced from each mRNA, right, is something. In the case, you know, the question is, is this the most likely number of proteins to observe? Is the distribution here, now, okay, right, this is a mean, right, but now we want to start thinking about the probabilistic, you know, stochastic elements. Is this the most likely, is the likely number of proteins observed from an mRNA? Okay, question is, is this the most likely? By, by which I mean, is the probability distribution peaked here? Okay, so we're going to do it. A is a yes, and B is a no. All right, does everybody understand the question that I'm trying to ask? All right, so an mRNA is, is here. There's going to be some proteins made from it. This is the mean. And I want to know, is, um, is, that what, is that what we should somehow expect? In the sense, is the, is the distribution peaked, the probability distribution peaked around this value? And C is, do I want to do it depends? Well, you can always argue <laughs> after, all right? Uh, do you need more time? So this, you're saying is this the most likely number of proteins? Yeah, I'm, what I'm wondering is, 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 the, um, you know, is the mode there. Right, but only for this quantity. Only, yeah, for, yeah. If, 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 but now, so now we're not doing means anymore. We want to know the probability distribution of the protein produced for each mRNA is, um, is the mode around this. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. All right, we got a lot of no's, but some yeses. All right, so this is actually going to be a no. And this was because the probability distribution. All right, we're going to, the question is, if, you know, what, what is the probability distribution for the number of proteins produced from each mRNA? It's going to be one of these. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we got some different, you know, but, uh, but I'd say that most of the group is the same. It's going to be A or B. And indeed, these are almost the same distributions. What, what, what's the difference between them? Right, so this guy's discrete. This guy's continuous. Right, indeed, when we're talking about the numbers, then we should get, it's a geometric. But, you know, often we're kind of a little bit, uh, loose about, about these things. So it's not a disaster if you said exponential. But the key thing is that the distribution looks something like, all right, so now I've certainly drawn it as an exponential. Right, this is the probability of n as a function of n. Of course, the geometric thing, it looks. I'm right? so sorry. So, so why should we expect that distribution? Why should we expect the distribution? So one answer is that, because um, that's what you read on Tuesday. But, um, but let's go ahead and. <laughs> Yeah, let, let's, let's, yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, <laughs> yes, all right, but let's go, let's go ahead and calculate it, all right, because um, it's useful. Okay, the way to think about this, in some ways, there's another way to, to write this, perhaps, which is that, imagine that you have an mRNA, okay, now, at some rate, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be degraded, um, and maybe we'll keep the degradation rate down, just for, so there's degradation rate. Um, but then, if you'd like, we could draw it like this, right? Where this is the this is the synthesis rate for a protein. You know, it out pops. You know, it out pops a protein. But we're gonna, okay, right. right so the idea is, okay, we, here's we're in some state where, okay, here we have an mRNA. Here's the state where we don't have an mRNA. Now this is the competition between those two rates that I was telling you about, right? There's some degradation rate for the mRNA, or there's a synthesis rate where we go around this loop. Right, if we come around this loop, we come back to the state with an mRNA. There still is an mRNA intact. It just out pops a protein. Okay. All right, so then what we want to do is we want to think about uh, 
what's the, what's the number of proteins that we expect, not just the mean, but the, the actual distribution? Right. You know, and so it, it's useful in, 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 these, uh, in these situations to define this uh, some probability uh, rho, which is, uh, which is the probability that you actually, if you're here, it's the probability that you produce one protein at least. Right? The question is, which path do you take initially? Right? Well, that's just given by the ratios. Right? So we, there's the rate that we take this circular path divided by the sum of these two other rates. Okay. And then what we can do is we can ask, well, what is the probability that zero proteins are produced? Okay. Probability that we get zero. Well, if we take this path initially, will we have zero proteins? No. no. Right, so this probability is indeed simply equal to the probability that we do this first, which is 1 minus rho. Yep. Okay. All right, now, what's the probability that we get one protein? Well, probably one. That's equal to the probability that we first take this path, and then we take this path. Okay. Well, we can multiply those probabilities, because the, this we first take the circular path to make a protein, and then we take the degradation path. All right. Well, what's the probability we get two? Right. Well, that's just that we come around here once, twice, and then degrade. Right. All right. Now, uh, if you're not seeing a pattern here, then, um, then we're in trouble. But, uh, Right, so, yeah, okay, so, so this is the probability of n will then just be equal to rho to the n, 1 minus rho. Okay. Um, and indeed, you, you know, it's, it's always useful in order to warm up your probability muscles to check to make sure that this is a, um, this is a normalized probability distribution, right? So sum over all possible n's indeed goes to 1. And that's just because the sum over a bunch of rho to the n's is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus rho, which is the term there, and that goes to 1. Okay. Um, so this is making a pretty strong assumption that these events are all independent? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. This is, this is, this is, assu this is assuming um, that, that if you've gone around once, you return. I mean, I, but I've, I've, you know, I've come back to the original state. So I, Look, there are a lot of things that, that can be true, right? Um, and I would say that uh, you know, in biology and in life, what you do is you first write down the simplest possible model. And then you go and you make measurements. And you ask whether the simplest possible model um, can adequately explain the data. And if the answer is no, then you're allowed to start thinking about other things. Because right? everything is, in principle, true, right? Uh, and that mRNA, oh, maybe it's this or that. You know, the question is whether it's significant. And at least from the data from Sunny's group would say that it, you know, in that condition, in those cells, that, it's, it's, that those things are not significant in the sense that you still get a geometric distribution. Of course, it could also be that, um, that those other things actually are true and are significant, but then you end up with some new parameters that describe the, you know, how, how things look as a result of all the complexity. But that's also OK in the sense that I, I'd say that you can get a, qu a quantitative description of the process by describing it as a geometric with just a single free parameter. And they found that the mean was, of, was 4 or 4 or 5, right? The mean number of proteins produced from, the mRNA, from each mRNA. But they, they, saw, they got this, this, this geometric distribution in that paper, right? Yes? Uh, and I, I'll just mention here that uh, the mean of this is, is rho divided by 1 minus rho. Okay. So what you see is that as rho goes to 1, then this thing is going to diverge. And that makes sense, because as, as rho goes to 1, it's saying that uh, you essentially always synthesize another protein rather than degrading. Okay. Um, and I just, before I move on, I just want to say one more thing, which is that there are many different definitions of the geometric distribution depending upon whether the probability of rho is the probability of terminating or the probability of going around, and also depending on whether you're asking what is the, here we're talking about the probability distribution for the number of proteins produced, whereas we could have talked about the probability distribution for the number of times we go around this loop before. No, 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 sorry. 
that, that, that is what the number of proteins produce. So, right, so um, the other way that you could have defined this is the, the number of times, or you know, it's, it's OK, the number of cycles that you had to go before you went here, in the sense that if, if you first go here, you could either call that a 0 or a 1. You see what I'm saying? And you know, reasonable people can disagree. So, but you end up getting distributions you know, that, are, that are just a little bit different. Okay, so watch out. If you just memorize something, you might have memorized the equation for a different definition of this distribution. Does everyone understand what I tried to say there? Maybe. <laughs> yeah? Ah, if there's no degradation, then would this be a Poisson? I mean, this would be infinity, right? Uh, Okay, um, all right, but okay, so I want to be clear. This is P of n is, uh, this is the probability distribution uh, for um, number of proteins n uh, produced from a single mRNA. Now, if, if there's no degradation of the mRNA, then um, then this thing is not even, I think, defined in, the, in, that, in that the number of proteins dis, uh, produced from that mRNA is just really goes to infinity. If you wanted to ask about the, prob the probability distribution for the number of proteins produced in some unit, some period of time, right, that would indeed be a Poisson distribution, I mean, assuming that there's no degradation. Right? Do, do, you under, do you understand what I'm trying to say? If SP, I'm sorry, if SP were 0? Um, OK, but and you're saying that what would be Poisson distributed? Yeah, I think that actually, it, it, yeah, no, I think, I think that, yeah, I think that you're probably right, that as SP goes to zero, I'm a little bit worried that. No, 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 zero order, sorry. Oh. Yeah, 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 not zero. Um, okay, um, right, so the mRNA distribution we're about to find is indeed going to be Poisson yeah, at steady state. Uh, and so if, 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 if there's some process by which the protein distribution is really just mirroring the, um, the mRNA distribution, then it will also be Poisson. Although I think you have to be careful about what, how you actually implement that. Um, because even in the absence of this geometric bursting, f different things I think can happen. Because, right? for example, if there were exactly 10 proteins produced from each mRNA, then that probability distribution is, is a shift. Right? But then it's, um, it, it's, not, it's no longer actually going to be uh, Poisson because the mean and variance are going to scale differently if you do that. All right, let, let, let's maybe do the, do the Poisson distribution for the mRNA first, and then we can try to um, touch back on this. Okay? Uh, all right, so th this is a plot of kind of geometric distribution with a mean of 3, 4-ish. Okay? Um, all right, is everybody, is everybody happy with, with, with where we are? No? Okay. Um, now, from this, what we've said so far, is it obvious what the distribution of proteins will be in a cell? So we can say obvious yes or not obvious no. Ready? Just verbal. Yes, ready or no. All right, ready? Three, two, one. No. no. Right. OK, so we've said that the, uh, the distribution of sizes of protein bursts from single mRNA is geometric. But that doesn't mean that that's going to be the distribution <laughs> of proteins in the cell. Uh, and indeed, after we're going to find that the distribution of mRNA is going to be Poisson, but even then, it's not obvious what the distribution of proteins is. Okay. All right. So what we want to do now is we want to introduce uh, kind of a simple version of what's known as the master equation. Okay. Now, you guys are going to do more reading on this 
for, uh, for the lecture on, on Tuesday, where we're going to talk about uh, the master equation as well as um, the Fokker Planck approximation, uh, maybe uh, the Gillespie algorithm, and so forth. But uh, I want to start by uh, thinking about this, uh, this, this notion in, in the simplest possible context. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about the world. All right. So we want to know the, the, the steady state, or the kind of the equilibrium distribution of mRNA numbers in the cell given this process. Right? Okay, so that's great. We can, um, all right, so uh, mRNA distribution question mark. Okay. Now, in this case, we don't care about SP, delta P, because the only things that are relevant are going to be these. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to think about the world in which um, we just define states corresponding to the different numbers of these mRNAs. Right. So there's a state where, OK, there's 0. All right, We can't go to the left less than 0, but we can go to um, the state where there's 1, or the state where there's 2, and so forth. Okay. All right. Now, the description here is, is supposed to be the analog of, of this over there. right? So this is trying to understand the situation where the deterministic equations would be described by m dot is equal to there's some synthesis rate but minus a degradation rate that's proportional to the number, right? So minus a, a delta m times m. Okay. Right. So what you can see is that the deterministic equations are very simple, right? We already calculated the equilibrium, right? So when this thing is equal to zero, then we get that m equilibrium is just going to be equal to the synthesis rate divided by the degradation rate. Right. If we're away from the equilibrium in this deterministic approximation, how long is it going to take us to kind of approach our equilibrium? Verbal answer. Ready? Three, two, one. one delta right. So the, the, it's going to be 1 over delta m. Right. So this tells us the characteristic time scale to come back. Right. So if we're, this is the equilibrium, sm over delta m. This is m as a function of time. Right? If we're below, we come here. If we're above, we come here. Right? And this, this time is 1 over delta m. Right? Are there any questions about? All right. Now, this, all right, so I, I want to highlight that this is like, the world's simplest dynamical equation, almost, almost the world's simplest, right? Um, yet, what we're going to find is that once we go over and we try to understand the full probability distribution uh, of the stochastic system, then you know it's it's a it's a little bit more complicated. In particular, we end up uh, with an infinite set of differential equations. Okay, right. So in general, uh, the master equation format, where we we're going to write differential equations for how these probabilities change over time. Now, what we've done is we've traded a single differential equation for an infinite number of differential equations, right? So that's, you know, that's a bummer. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it will allow us to do a, the full stochastic treatment. And, um, and it's also a nice, um, t to me, the master equation is useful kind of in two ways. One is that uh, it is a, it's going to be a tool for us to do analytic calculations. But it's also a uh, kind of a principled way of organizing your thoughts so that you can go and do stochastic simulations if that's what you want to do. So um, it's also just kind of like a way station to kind of help you set up your, uh, your simulation. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask about the general way that this thing is going to move between different states. In particular, we. Uh, are going to have some general state in here, mn, which can go forward or back, mn plus 1. Um, now, what we want to do is think about how, the, how those probabilities are going to change over time. Right? So, 
we typically have Fn. Fn. Okay, so this is often written as an Fn and Fn minus 1. And then this is a G. I want to make sure I get the n's and n minus 1's correct here. Okay. Typically, we write Gn plus 1, Gn. All right. So th these are telling us about the rates of this um, of being in this state with, say, n mRNAs and the, as compared to going here or going here. Right. So then what we can do is we can write the change in uh, the probability uh, of mn uh, with respect to time. OK, well, there are, there are just a few different ways that the probability can change, right? So we can leave this state in two different ways, right? Fn, my, um, gn, OK, so, right. so there, the, one, the way that we, we lose the probability is that we have Fn plus gn times the probability that we are in mn. OK, that's an n there. Right? And then there are going to be two ways that we gain probability. Right? We can gain probability from the mn minus 1. So this is fn minus 1, minus 1, plus we can get probability from the upper state. That's a gn plus 1, mn plus 1. Okay. So this is just saying that. <laughs> The change in the probability of being in this state is going to be given by the probability that we leave the state. Or sorry, the probability that we enter the state minus the probability that we're leaving the state. Okay, kind of the rates. Okay, now this is going to be true for all n except for n uh, equal to zero. We don't have uh, the terms over on the left. Okay, so this is um, this is kind of for all for all n, right? So this is. In particular, this is for n basically 0 on up to infinity. Right? So this is a differential equation for the probability of, being in, of having n mRNA. But this is, we have to have a different equation for each n, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay. on up. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, this is what I mean by converting a single differential equation, which is actually an exceedingly, exceedingly simple one. For one that is for an infinite set, and each one is even a, a little bit more complicated, right? In, in general, these f's and n's can uh, can be can be pretty complicated. Uh, in in this situation, they're not they're not so bad. But uh, let, let's make sure. Let's all right. Can can somebody say what f n and g n are equal to? Any volunteers? Right, so Fn, okay, this is, the, this is the rate that we add a new mRNA. Well, that's just the synthesis rate for mRNA. And this guy is what? Delta. Right, so this is, all right, so this is degradation rate. Um, and we actually do have to multiply still by uh, the number n. Okay. And that's because as we go further out here to the right, then it is true that the rate, the, the rate at which we come back to the left is increasing, right? Because there's just more uh, mRNA that can be degraded. Okay. All right. Now, it's worth saying that you can, for example, use this to simulate the probability distribution uh, if you start from any distribution you like. So, for example, you could start m0 equal to 1 and then just simulate how the probability kind of like recalibrates and comes over here. Similarly, you could do it over here. You could start with any probability distribution you want, and you could uh, use this as a framework to calculate what the probability distribution will be at any time later. Right? Um, but you can also use this just as a way of um, figuring out what the, uh, what the equilibrium distribution is going to be. Because at, at equilibrium, we can just ask, okay, for, for each one of these arrows, uh, the probability of moving to the right has to be equal to the probability of moving to the left. Otherwise, we wouldn't be at equilibrium. Right. And that's true for every one of these kinds of pairs of arrows. Okay. And uh, in particular, what we can uh, get, and I want to make sure that, so, but it's not that Fn is equal to Gn minus, all right. right. So it's really going to end up being that if you see what Fn and Gn, you know, so that Fn is going to have to be equal to g of n plus 1, right? 
for all n. Yes? Ah, yes, yes, it, um, indeed. Uh, so that, sorry, times mn times m of n plus 1. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yes, so it's, it's, the, it's the kind of probability flux that we have to equalize. Right? All right, so this is nice because this gives us a ratio of, of things. Right? In particular, this tells us that the probability of being in the n plus 1 divided by the probability of being n, and this is, um, this is at equilibrium. It is going to be Fn divided by Gn plus 1, right, which is this synthesis rate. And then down here is going to be this degradation rate times, uh, in this case, n plus 1. Okay. Right, so this, this is useful. Because, for example, if we start at m, you know, we could say that, all right, m1 over m0, and well, maybe we'll even put the m0 over on the, on the right. OK. All right, so then m1, all right, well, what is that equal to? That's going to be synth synthesis rate divided by degradation rate times m0, right? But then we also know that m2, well, that's going to be, again, Synthesis rate divided by degradation rate, and we're going to get a squared. But then now we have to divide by a half times m0. All right. Continuing on, m3. Oops. All right, we got sm over delta m cubed divided by 1 over 3 times 2 times m0. All right, so in general, we get the probability of being in the nth state is going to be this thing. We'll call it lambda for now. Lambda to the n divided by n factorial times m0. Right? Now, what's the, um, all right, and uh, I'll, I'll, okay, remember lambda here, we've defined it to be the, the ratio sm over delta m. Now, if we sum over all these probabilities, what should we get? One. All right, if we sum over this thing, what is that equal to? It's, well, uh, no. E to the lambda. E to the lambda, right? The, so the, just remember in this world, all right, the, the sum over lambda to the n, n factorial, from n equal to 0 to infinity. This is indeed the definition of e to the lambda. All right, so what that means is that the normalization condition is that m0 has to be equal to e to the minus lambda. Which is indeed a Poisson distribution. Raise it up a little bit. All right. Okay. All right. So this is saying, okay, to back up, right? If we just have constant rate of creation of something, constant rate of degradation of that thing on a per item basis, right, a per unit basis, then you end up getting a Poisson distribution for uh, at, at equilibrium for for the number of of that thing. Um, in this case, the number of mRNA in the cell. Questions about why that is, what happened, how we calculate it? Sure. Um, so this is basically f of n, and this is basically like this g of n, but uh, remember here. M is the number of proteins or the number of mRNA, right? So then that's that's in the context in the con context of, of the master equation, then M and N are there. You get N by the current number of M. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm confused how you change M naught to E to the minus lambda. 
OK. Um, well, let's just do it. All right, so what we know, so mn, this is the probability that we observe uh, n mRNA, right? And we know that the sum over mn, so all these probabilities from n equal to 0 to infinity, uh, is, has to be equal to 1. Right? Something has to happen. Right? So this is, OK, well, let's just do the sum. Okay, this is equal to the sum lambda to the n over n factorial m0. Right. Right, but m zero. Does this is this a function of n? No. Right. M zero is just this is just the probability at equilibrium that you have zero mRNA. Right. So we can just pull this thing out. Right. This is just some number, some probability. So, okay. Now the statement is that well, this thing, this is the definition of e to the lambda. So in general, because right, we always, OK, so e to the x we often write is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus dot, dot, dot. Right? Okay. So this thing is indeed just equal to e to the lambda. Okay, so what we know is that you know, this is still 1. right? So 1, you know, m0 times e to the lambda is equal to 1. So m0 is e to the minus lambda. All right, any other questions about how we got here? <coughs> What's going on? Yes? The plot of the solution to the equation. That yes. Would be, uh, yeah. That would be like the, the mean value. That would be the behavior of the mean value. That, that is the expected behavior of the mean value over time. Right. In this case, fn and gn are both linear functions of the number of the mRNA, which means that. Uh, in the context of the master equation, if you ask about the expectation of the um, of mn, right? This this quantity uh, is indeed equal to. It has the same behavior as uh, you know over time as as the deterministic equations. Okay. So that you know if 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 f and g are nonlinear, then actually you get a deviation. But, uh, but in, this, in this case, it, it is indeed the same. What it means is that if you, uh, if you compare the stochastic and the deterministic trajectories, what you would see is that, uh, well, this thing is going to be a little bit you know, jagged or whatnot. And then even at equilibrium, it's going to come up and down a little bit. Right? I'm trying to add a little bit of jaggedness because it's discrete. Right? But the deterministic equation here, is what you'd get if you average together an infinite number of these stochastic trajectories. Because right, another one might have come down here. And then, does that answer? No, I'm... Is, is m playing a double role? Like in that deterministic equation, m is the concentration yeah, I, of mRNA. I think that I'm. Um, yeah, no, I think that I should. I, my nomenclature, I think, was not very good. I've I've used two different things, so and I I think I okay. now that I'm doing this, I think that I I should have. Yeah, I should have I should have just called it p of n, or maybe I should have used n here. You know, uh, yeah. Um, right. I think I was trying to be consistent with some of the previous, you know, but I think it was a mistake. You know. Um, yes. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm plotting. Uh, okay. Um, so so no, I'm not. Uh, okay. So this is if you run an actual uh, stochastic trajectory, then at, at any moment in time you just have one. There's some number of mRNA, right? Whereas the the sum over the mNs. This is this is talking about the probability distribution of the entire thing, right? So really. If you started here, the master equation would give you some distribution for the m's, some distribution for the m's, right? And so if you, if you looked at these over time, then the mean, is in, the mean of these distributions is indeed equal to the uh, deterministic um, behavior. Yeah. Is it possible to recover? Like, how would we recover the differential equation from, from the master equation? Is that possible? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that. In the end, there's going to be a one-to-one -one relationship from, I guess, this 
differential equation to the master equation. I'm trying to think of any any weird case where something funny is going to happen. Is something funny going to happen? No, but like the easy way is just to write the model in terms of the distribution, and you can just differentiate the whole sum, and then yeah. in that sum you express. Right, okay, but I think this is the much more mathematical way. I mean, because I think that actually, I mean, the, from the differential equation, you actually, from the terms here, you can actually construct the master equation, right? And I think but the same way you can go from the master equation, and I, th I think that there's going to be a unique differential equation that would have gotten you to that master equation. So I think just from the terms, you can do it, right? You can also do like moment generating functions to get the, how, the, how, the, how things change, right? But I mean, I think that it's really, um, from this, for example, I think it, it tells you that that was the differential equation. Does that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of, uh, the, I mean, the way that we typically do these things is that we have a differential equation, and then we construct the master equation. So then we already knew what the differential equation was. But I think f just from the terms in, in your master equation, you can say, all right, well, this, this had to have been the, this was the differential equation that it started with. Um, any other questions about what happened here? All right, so we, we have, I think, a fair number, a fair knowledge of what's going on here now, right? We know that the Equilibrium distribution of mRNA in the cell is going to be Poisson. We also know that the distribution of the number of mRNA produced per cell cycle is also Poisson, but it's a different Poisson from the first one. All right, we know that the number of protein produ produced per mRNA is going to be geometrically distributed. Right? Uh, the one thing that we have not yet done is to ask about the, uh, the distribution of uh, protein in the cell. So let's, uh, let's say something about that. I'm not going to do the whole derivation because it's harder. But I encourage you to, uh, well, even the continuous version of the derivation is, a, is, a, is, a, is harder, than, you know, it's definitely harder than this. But then the, um, the discrete derivation is even worse. So, um, so what we're going to talk about, and the way that we'll typically maybe think about this from the standpoint of this class is, um, is the continuous approximation to now, that might have ended up being useful. Well, um, it's OK. Is the continuous approximation uh, to, the real, um, to the real answer? Uh, and in particular, just the way that the exponential is the continuous approximation of uh, the, the geometric distribution. All right. In the same way, you can think about the, um, the equilibrium distribution of protein in the cell in this model is going to be gamma distributed. Right? So, but gamma is a, is a continuous distribution, but it's, kind of, it's a continuous analog. Uh, of, uh, of the negative binomial. All right, so let me just make sure I'm. All right, and Sonny Shi actually has a nice, uh, uh, a nice pa PRL paper where he derives uh, the, the gamma distribution. Uh, but even earlier, actually, uh, Paulson had derived this uh, negative binomial distribution, the, dis the discrete version of the solution. Okay. All right. So this is the number of protein per cell. Right, we already know the mean. All right. All right, so this is, um, this is approximately distributed as a gamma. All right, a gamma is a distribution that requires two parameters to describe. All right, so a Poisson can be described by a single parameter. All right, gamma is typically described by two. All right. All right, uh, and B is going to be the burst size, <coughs> whereas A is uh, the mean number of bursts uh, Per cell cycle. Which is the same as the, the mean number of mRNA produced per cell. Okay, mean number of births. So, okay. All 
Right, so the gamma uh, of this AB All right, so uh, the gamma of A uh, this is the gamma function. It's uh, equal to, uh, now, is A minus 1 factorial? Or is, I always get the, is it A minus 1 or A plus 1 factorial? Anybody remember this? Yeah, A minus 1. Okay. All right, so, you know, I mean, it's like a lot of things. You know, you look at this equation. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. But I think that a reasonable way to think about this is the gamma is um, approximately what you get when you uh, add together a different exponentials with uh, length scale given by b. Okay, and when you add probability distributions, you have to do a convolution. Right? So in some ways, the way to think about it, and this kind of makes sense, because what is happening is that uh, it takes something of order uh, cell division time for these proteins to go away because they're stable, right? Now, each, um, and, and so then what you want to know is, all right, how many proteins are kind of produced over the course of a cell cycle? Okay, well, you know, that actually you can get at by asking, all right, how many, uh, how many bursts are there going to be, and then how big are the bursts? Okay. All right, so indeed the mean here is equal to A times B. And the variance is equal to a times b squared. Okay. All right, so for example, if you have a single exponential distribution with burst size b, then this is, this is what you get. Right? So this is the probability that you get n proteins. And this is as a function of n. Right? So for a single burst, it's kind of, this is exponentially distributed because so this is the continuous version, right? Now, if we add together multiple of these bursts, this is really saying that we sample from this distribution, say, twice, and, we, and then we, we add the resulting uh, value, right? So this is a convolution. You guys will have an opportunity to practice this on your problem sets. Uh, but what happens is that you end up getting something that looks like, well, it's going to go, be, yeah, well, okay. So it increases linearly. If you had, if you had three of them together, you, it, this increases as quadratic and kind of goes like that. All right, so this thing uh, becomes uh, kind of, it goes from a situ uh, distribution where it's peaked at 0 to something that's peaked at a non-zero value. Right? Now, you can ask, for example, what happens as, you know, for large A, right, if you have many bursts, what does this thing look like? Oh, I wish I hadn't, I hadn't erased my probability distributions. All right, so what does a gamma converge to for large A? A normal distribution, right? Okay, so that's the central limit theorem. And right, if you take any well-behaved probability distribution, you add it, you, you sample from it many times, then you end up getting a Gaussian. Right? All right, um, if, if, that, if, if you don't remember that very well, then this is something to, um, to read about over the weekend. Okay. Um, all right, just like the Poisson is also going to go to uh, the, for large lambda, the Poisson also looks like a, um, also looks like a Gaussian. Can somebody give an explanation for why, an intuitive explanation for why that should be? Why it, yes? Okay, so a Poisson distribution can't have any, okay, but now I feel like you're arguing against me. Oh, but. Because uh, a Gaussian has negative values, right? Right. Okay, yeah, all right. So, you're, okay, so what you're saying is that you know, Poisson for small lambda, right, it, it can't go negative. Um, okay, no, I think that that's, that's true. Um, yeah, so it's somehow the probability distribution is somehow piling up, as you say, right? Um, what are some other ways of thinking about this? I 
Imagine them stretching out. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's fair. Another way we can think about this is let's say that we have some process that's occurring randomly over some period of time. Okay, and this could be the say mRNA production, right? And and here this is just the number that we observe here. This is going to be Poisson with some mean lambda, right? Now let's just say that I take another one. Same process, same period of time. How is this guy going to be distributed? All right, so this is also Poisson of lambda. Okay. Now, let's say I take this probability distribution and I take this probability distribution and I convolve them. All right, I'm going to do the calculation in my head. All right, I did it. Okay, so for those of you who haven't done convolutions, you know, you know, whatever. All right, no, but uh, yeah. So what, what what's the new distribution going to be? Poisson two lambda. Okay, and why does that have to be? Yeah. That's right. This line, I just kind of like, I just made it up. You know, I could have just said, oh, well, it's the same process occurring over here. So we have to have the mean. It still is going to be a Poisson process. And the mean has to be the, you know, well, it's, we just had twice the length. And indeed, for independent probability distributions, means always add. Right? So this is all consistent with other things we know. Right, so this has to be Poisson of 2 lambda. All right, if I add another segment on here, it has to be Poisson of 3 lambda. Da, da, right? But what you see is that we see that Poisson of n lambda which is the sum over many Poissons. Right? It's a, it, you know, Poissons are well-behaved probability distributions. You add them together, you're going to have to get a Gaussian. Right? So, already, so you can see that, uh, that the Poisson has to become Gaussian for a large lambda. And, it, and indeed, it does. So, you know. okay. so there's a comment about this in the. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, I guess, because um, obviously, you could always just divide Poisson of lambda up into like, infinitely many, infinitely many OK, you're saying, that, you're saying that if I do this calculation backwards, I'm going to get into trouble. Because if I try to break them, yeah. So um, do you require lambda to be, you know, you have to have like a, a significant probability of getting at least one count, right? Yeah. So I'd say lambda has to be much, much larger than one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So I'm, once you're at like lambda of 100, it, it looks like a Gaussian. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and in Sonny's paper, he had a comment about this. Does anybody remember what it was? Was, uh, was mRNA production really well described as, I mean, he, he, they, they mentioned that actually there's, a, a viola, there's some violation of, of this model in, in the data. Yeah. Oh, as soon as you go into eukaryotes, yeah, you know, this is why I you know, stay away from them. No, but even, no, even in their data, uh, in E. coli, they, they actually observed a deviation. Um, No. All right. Yeah. So what, what they found is that there was a cell cycle dependence to the uh, to this burst uh, bursting rate, i.e., the mRNA production over the course of the cell cycle, right? Uh, and and presumably their conclusion of this was that all right, you have this guy, and then he turns into gets longer, and then eventually you know he septates, and then you get two cells. Oops. Well. All right. All right. So that what what he found is that you know these longer cells at actually a, a larger rate of mRNA synthesis than the smaller cells. And actually, this makes sense because here you maybe have just one copy of the genome, whereas here you might have, you're, getting, you're making a second copy, right? So you might have two, co you, you might have two copies of that, of that gene. Right? So it may make sense that the, 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 this bursting rate should grow. Okay? But does that mean that you should not expect it to be po a Poisson distribution for the number of bursts per cell cycle? It actually still, it's, it still is described by a Poisson. Because you can just say, this is the cell cycle. You know, and, and here, this is Poisson of some lambda 1. Here is a Poisson of some lambda 2. So there could be a different rate over the course of the thing. But you still have just two Poissons. You still get another Poisson. All right, so adding Poissons gives you back a Poisson. All right. They don't have to have the same mean lambda.
I just want to uh, make one comment about uh, what you have to do once you start thinking about eukaryotes. And the basic, uh, oh, oh, right. So you can see the gamma distribution can either be peaked at 0 or it can be peaked at a non-zero value. Right? Uh, and for most, for like highly expressed proteins, you'll see that it looks something like this. Okay? Now, for eukaryotes, you also have to consider there's some rate that you go uh, between an active and an inactive promoter. And this actually makes things much more complicated. Okay? So this is a, this is a rate going to, in, to inactive, rate going to active. Right? And so now, if you look at, for example, the mRNA uh, number per cell, you'll see that it is no longer a Poisson. Okay? And I encourage you, if you're curious about such things, to come up uh, and, and look at this. Uh, this, the, the solution for the steady state distribution has been solved analytically. For example, uh, Arjun Raj, who was the author of the review that you guys just read, uh, derived this, uh, this equation here, which I don't know if you can see, you know, but even from a distance, you can see that this is the solution. And this is just for the mRNA distribution. This is not even getting to the level of the protein. Okay? Um, and it involves many gamma functions, as well as a confluent hypergeometric function of the first kind. Um, which is, you know, it's a disaster. Um, but you know, he, you know, he went to Courant. He was, he was an applied mathematician. So this is, I guess, this is what you can do after doing a PhD in applied mathematics. Uh, right, so the, the point, though, is that uh, it, it ends up being very complicated. And you can get uh, hugely varying distributions for the mRNA. And indeed, uh, this is seen in individual cells. If you look at mammalian cells, just the M, at the mRNA level, you can have some cells that don't have, hard, they have hardly any mRNA, some that have a huge number. Okay. The protein distributions actually end up being uh, uh, more regular than the mRNA distributions because of the, this, this difference in lifetime. Right? So the mRNA numbers may fluctuate wildly, but uh, the protein numbers will fluctuate less because they last longer. Right? So then you do some averaging over this crazy mRNA business. Okay. Um, okay. Now, in the last, yeah, go ahead. Ah uh, yes. All right, that's a good question. All right, so the, um, all right, I think that people argue very much about this. Okay, but this, you know, is, is kind of minutes. This can be, you know, hours, and this is maybe in between those time scales would be a typical. Um, and when I say hours, especially like in mammalian cells, um, they might only divide once a day or so, right? So then, um, yeah. So this this gets to be many hours, right? And and then I'd say. Yeah, minutes is kind of the, yeah. Okay. All right, so there, there were many biological examples that were discussed in that review. And I'm, uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. But I think that it, it's a nice review because it, it, it goes over some of the papers that you've read or that we've talked about over the course of the semester. Uh, it also kind of illustrates some different biological contexts in which noise may play a role. Um, but I want to mention one study that was done by, actually, again, uh, Arjun, together with uh, Hedia Mamar, in uh, uh, collaboration with Dave Dubnow, where they were studying this process of competence. Right? So in B. subtilis, during sometimes, particularly of starvation or other forms of unhappiness, they, uh, they kind of pick up DNA from outside. Right? So they'll import DNA. You know, some of it may just be consumed, but some of it could actually be uh, incorporated into the genome. Right? Now, uh, what, what they found is that this competence process is mediated by this protein COMK. And, there's, and there was a positive feedback loop where this guy ends up positively activating itself. Right? And this helps lead to bistability in this network. Right? Only a small fraction of the cells kind of get in, into this high feedback state. Only a small fraction of them activate competence and then uptake DNA. And what they were able to show in that study was that, that it was sort of noise-induced, okay? that they were able to vary both the transcription rate and the translation rate in a way so as to reduce the noise. Okay? The mean is the same. Right? So if you, in, in the context of, of this model, right, what they did is they varied transcription rate and they tr varied translation rate, uh, each, say, by a factor of two. So they got the same mean, but then different noise. Right? 
And we're out of time. I would have you vote. But can anybody remember? If you want to decrease the noise in the number of the protein, which, which, which of these do you want to go up and which do you want to go down? Right. Yeah, which one's going up? Well, which one's going up, let's say? SM. Right. So if you want to reduce the noise but keep the mean constant, you, you increase the rate of transcription and you decrease the rate of translation because uh, the noise is really driven by this protein bursting behavior here. Right? And so that's precisely what they did. They changed those two quantities. They got the same mean, lower noise, and then they reduced the amount of competence in that circuit.